welcome, welcome this afternoon to the celebration of life for Victoria. I, it's, so, it's so good that you've all come, and thank you all for coming in a really crazy day weather-wise, and, uh, and a storm in so many other ways. So welcome, welcome to the family. Um, my prayer for today is that this would be a safe place, that this would be a place of comfort, a place of peace for you as, uh, as we gather to celebrate Victoria, to remember her, to honor her, and to grieve together as a family, as a community, and that we would come together and just uh, comfort one another. We so need that. And uh, so a warm welcome on behalf of, Je of, uh, behalf of General Shepherd Church. I did have the privilege of being Victoria's youth pastor for a few years. She used to come to youth group uh, many years ago, <laughs> and uh, I have so many memories of uh, both Victoria and Alana coming and uh, the family, so um, it's it mixed emotions here today, And uh, but I'm really glad that all of you could come, and, and let's just, uh, just hear from God and, and hear from one another as we celebrate Victoria. Um, again, I spoke with the family briefly before the service, but my condolences to you, uh, Bill and Barbara, Alana, Taylor, the whole family, extended family, friends, my deepest condolences. It, it's uh, not really, you can't have a lot of words, but uh, just from the heart, we just are with you and we want to uh, be prayerful and and supportive of you guys in the days to come as well. What I'd like to do is just open uh, this service with prayer and pray for it. And then uh, Uncle Brian is going to come and MC the tributes. And we're just going to take some time to, uh, to really celebrate Victoria uh, together. So let's, if you wouldn't mind, pray uh, along with me. And let's just give this time uh, to God. God, thank you for these moments together. God, thank you for the gift of community and the gift of gathering together, the gift of Victoria and her life. Father, thank you that your word says that you are close to the brokenhearted. And so you are very close to us and very close to this family. And uh, I just pray, Lord, that uh, this uh, gathering together will be part of the healing process, be part of the grieving process, Lord, and uh, that these moments would be peaceful and, and, um, and meaningful and important for all of us here. Be with those who are still coming, Lord, in the storm. Be with each one as we go from this place later on. Keep everyone safe back to their homes, I pray, or the places where they're going. But Lord, for these moments together, may we very much sense your love, sense your peace, and have the hope that we grieve, but we also grieve with hope because of the Lord Jesus and all of that he's done for us. So come, I pray, may these uh, moments together be really important and really special. In your name, I Uncle Bill, uh, Brian. <laughs> I'm not sure where Bill came from, but. Uh... Well, it is one of those days that I think you can't never. In fact, whenever you come to honor somebody who is very much a part of the family through the years, and who's left us early, in fact, and left us much too early, and with Victoria being the special person that she was, it is so important to see the group here together, and your support is very much appreciated. On behalf of Bob, Bill, Lana Taylor, the Gosford family, the Aphex family. 
how warming this is actually to sea level here. And I will say I have a special affiliation with Victoria, as many of us would, in the sense that Barb and Bill's home was our home, away from home, when we were in the Eugenia area. We would stay at Barb and Bill's house. And normally the person whose room we would get is Victoria, and she would move to the basement, and we would all be one family together. And it was through that and that, and, and knowing Victoria over the years, just to know the special person that she was. So, there's a number of stories I could tell with regard to Victoria, but before I did that, I just wanted to share an experience I had a number of years ago, because we're at that day where we're actually, it's, it's pivotal, is how I would describe it. And I'll put it in the context, as it was given to me many years ago in the military. Uh, it's not uncommon uh, for young military men to leave this earth much too early. Accidents happen, and that's the way it is. And I was going to a memorial service, in fact, for someone very close to the age of, of Victoria, and the Padre happened to be with us. And he had been my chaplain when I went to the military department. And we, we were talking about it, in fact, about a young person such as this moving on much too early and, and what an impact that actually has upon you. And the Padre, I'll just share with you what he said to me, and it's something that we've carried with us through the years, in fact. He said, uh, he acknowledged it is really, really a tragedy to think that this would happen. But he said, we're at this day, and this day is the one when we'll do the memorial service. And he said, yesterday was when we said farewell in the sense that the person had passed on. But today is the day when we actually remember the person for what they wear, just how special they wear. And out of those memories, and out of those remembrances, in fact, come the name. And I thought back to the situation of Victoria and exactly what it meant. This is where we are. We're at that day. Yesterday has come and gone. But we have to think about today and tomorrow because we're moving forward from here. And with regards to that, with regards to the remembrance that you're going to hear today from the family, in fact, how important those are in setting the stage. Because those will form the memory. So we will never forget what happened yesterday, but we will remember today. And tomorrow, those memories will form how we will remember Victoria and how important it is to us to get to this day. So with regards to that, it, it is, Today is where we're at, and in fact, the program, I think, really reflects upon Victoria that you're going to start. And I can't think of a better person to start it off with than her sister, Atlanta, so close to her over the years, and someone who can probably articulate, but in the same sense, bring that feeling to it as well. Atlanta, could I ask you up, please? Tuesday, April 10th, National Siblings Day for the rest of the world. But for me, the day that God took my only sibling home and gave me another guardian angel.
When my grandmother passed away this past September, Victoria told my mom that she was looking forward to seeing her again one day. And I have to believe that Victoria is with her now, but it came far too soon, far too young. Victoria and I didn't always see eye to eye, as I was a very bossy older sister, and she was a girl with her own opinions and a mind of her own. As many of you know, I have recently begun my career as an elementary school teacher, and now get to take my bossiness out on people other than my own family. <laughs> what some of you may not know is that I have been a teacher for many, many years, with Victoria being my first pupil. Some of my earliest memories are playing school, where I, and occasionally one of my friends, were the teachers, and Victoria and her friends were the students. I loved giving math tests and spelling dictations, and was always surprised and disappointed when my students didn't want to play after a short 10 minutes. Not only was I Victoria's teacher, but also her lifeguard. When she was about three and me about five, I was fishing off the end of the dock one lovely summer day. My mother was happily videotaping from the deck, and Victoria came down and started bugging me to join in. I informed her that her fishing rod was in the boathouse. She went, got her rod, wound up her real big cast, and followed the rod right into the lake. Watching this video years later, we hear a big crash, and the rest of the video consists of the roof of the veranda and a frantic mother screaming, Grab Victoria! Grab Victoria! I swiftly grabbed the collar of her jacket and held her above water long enough that my mom could come to the rescue. Some of my other childhood memories include playing Barbies, which in our older years, I made Victoria pay me to play with her. <laughs> <laughs> and also playing dogs, where we would crawl around on our hands and knees, barking and eating out of bowls. If Victoria were here, she would insist that I tell you that I was the only one who tried real dog food. She stuck with the pretend stuff. <laughs> this game became an issue when we began using collars and leashes and tying one another to the pole outside the house, but luckily the neighbors never called CAS. <laughs> In, her, in our older years, we enjoyed countless hours tubing and sea doing, as spending time in and on the water was one of Victoria's favorite pastimes. This is perhaps what led to her love of fish, and eventually dogs, and then cats, and then rabbits. And oh, did I mention the pot belly pig? <laughs> Victoria's love for animals was like none other, and she will be greatly missed by her two little fur babies, Dakota and Zazu. Victoria had a bit of a wild side, which anyone who rode on our golf cart through the bush trails would have experienced firsthand. We were lucky enough to have neighbors that also had a golf cart, and let's just say that tag has a whole new meaning when you add two golf carts and two gossip girls. <laughs> Another one of Victoria's passions was media. She loved photography, music, and movies. We have watched hundreds of movies together and could quote some of them backwards and forwards. One in particular was The Lion King. Victoria took a real liking to the As a Bunya song, <laughs> and would often sing this at the top of her lungs in public settings to embarrass those with her and get a rise out of anyone within earshot. During these many movies, Victoria was very affectionate. She would call me her snuggle bunny and could never get enough hugs and cuddles. Victoria and I loved our nicknames. When she was a toddler, we were all doing our own thing around the house, and my mom and dad noticed Victoria wasn't with me. 
They asked me where she was, but I didn't know. After looking around for a couple of minutes, I found her hiding in the clothes closet and yelled out, Here's the little snook of boobers. Here's the little who, replied my parents. And from then on, she was a little snook of boobers. In our preteen years, we went through a short phase where we decided we no longer wanted to be called by our first names, but rather abbreviations of our middle names, and insisted that our parents call us by that. As I mentioned before, Victoria was never afraid to show her affection for people. After my first visit to the hospital about four weeks ago, I went to say goodbye to Victoria as it was time for me to head home. She was under the influence of some pain medication and was dozing in and out, but nonetheless, I went to give her a hug and kiss her on the cheek. Much to my surprise, she stuck out her lips like a fish and gave me a big smooch on the lips and formed, informed me that my breath smelled like perfume. <laughs> I am so unbelievably thankful to have spent every minute that I did with Victoria over the last month despite her declining health. On April 9th, I stayed the night with her, not knowing that this would be our last together. The following morning, she was a little bit less responsive than the previous day, but still opening her eyes occasionally and communicating on some level. I was tired after a sleepless night and left her alone with her visitors to go rest in the family lounge. I wish I had known.
I would like now to move to, to France and back with Lynn Victoria Seguri Bell and invite up Chantelle Hobson and also Michelle Gordon, please. Now we'll play the musical tribute, Tears in Heaven. Thank 
Beautifully done, Chantal, and Scott. Beautifully done for a great reflection and tutorial. We'll continue now in thought and we'll bring it to the families. I'll ask two of the cousins to come forward Brooke Anderson and Jean Grimm. If you would come forward and reflect from a cousin's perspective of the play. everybody for being here with us today. Victoria touched a lot of lives in a lot of ways, so she would love to know how equally devastated and at a loss we all are in the wake of her passing. She would not want a dry eye in this place because as we all know, she always had a flair for drama. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Brooke. Alana Victoria's coolest cousin. <laughs> and the girls are like sisters to me growing up. As I mentioned, Victoria loved to be dramatic. She would laugh the hardest, scream the loudest, and if you were ever on her bad side, you would certainly know it. She could reach a level of sarcasm you didn't know existed. 
and she once didn't speak to me for three days because I threw a piece of seaweed at her. <laughs> Drew and I spent every school holiday and most weekends here in Eugenia. Summer days were filled with boating, bonfires, and Barbies. Even though Victoria always made you play Ken, <laughs> Victoria was happiest when she was outside, and Barb and Bill spared no expense when it came to the girls. Victoria would always try to convince you to join her on the trampoline or rock the hammock until one of you fall out, and it was usually her. And Victoria would spend her days ripping around on the sea dew and laying in the sun by the lake. Or off-roading in the golf cart, where I'm convinced she developed reckless driving, ha driving habits for life. <laughs> Thinking back on all the memories I have with the girls, and the first word that comes to mind when I think about Victoria is unlucky. She was always getting hurt or getting herself into trouble, and she would not need your help to do it. We would play endless rounds of hide-and-go-seek and manhunt in the Gostick neighborhood. And Victoria once climbed over a fence and landed on a hornet's nest and got stung about 20 times. And only a few weeks later, we were playing again. Victoria decided to visit the same hiding place and fell off that same fence. But Victoria was never one to learn from her mistakes. Her unlucky streak extended to family gatherings. I'm sure the Aikids remember when she was bit by Lady, Grandma's Pomeranian, who was more fluff than dog. <laughs> but it speaks to how forgiving she was because she had a deep love and respect for all animals, and she loved her dogs like her children. She loved to also be at Robert and Nancy's farm, surrounded by the kittens and the cows. But despite how accident prone she was, she was always up for adventure. Exploring at Grandma's was routine for us. Alana was the bossy one, but Victoria would always find a way to get her way. We were often told not to go beyond the water wheel, but Victoria would lead us on an expedition to Grandma's barn and shed where the tractor was stored. And she would tattle on us to Barb for breaking the rules. <laughs> she was very impatient as a child. She had a dream to build a tree house at one point, and after attempting to nail two by four boards to some trees, we quickly gave up on that idea. She also loved pranks. <laughs> the whoopee cushion was never far behind her. And one time she called a neighbor fr neighborhood friend over because she wanted to dump a bucket of water on her head from the roof. <laughs> like the responsible cousin and the mature one of the group, I helped her get the bucket of water onto the roof. But after a few minutes of waiting, Victoria got bored, so we moved on to something else. <laughs> I'll never forget the four of us running around Grandma's like feral children. And one time we ended up in the Gostick van. Because everyone leaves their keys in their cars up here, Alana and Victoria convinced me to turn the key in the ignition and start the van. My dad must have heard it turn over because he came running out of the house like I have never seen him move before. And as he's sprinting towards the van, I can hear Victoria say from the back, lock the doors. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, Trevor, and Kevin would tease us, so we in turn would tease Buzz and Mal relentlessly at Christmases and just whenever we could get their attention. And Victoria had a travel bug. It started with camping as kids going coast to coast across Canada and then across the, conti the continent to Costa Rica in her older years. She always enjoyed our trips to the East Coast and I feel so fortunate to have been a part of her last trip to Nova Scotia. having one too many at the lower deck and celebrating Bethany's wedding. The one thing my stories all have in common is that Atlanta and Victoria were always together. They love each other deeply and openly with only a bond that two sisters can share.
because we all began missing Victoria long before today. She would call me in a frenzy about some sort of crisis she was having and insist on driving to Toronto. She, we would chat for a few hours and then she would drive all the way home. Those visits became less frequent. Messages were fewer and farther between when we missed Victoria more. She always felt that she could reach out to Michelle, who would always go out of her way to help any way she could. But no one loved her more or supported her more than Barb. I want to thank you, Barb, for always being the person that she was never afraid to turn to. It made it easier knowing we're always there for her and looking after her. One of the last times I saw Victoria was visiting Grandma at Great Gables. We had some sort of performance going on. We were sitting outside and Victoria hand-fed Grandma three pieces of cake and kept telling her that she deserved it. <laughs> she was truly a beautiful person inside and out and I only wish she could have seen that in herself the way that everybody else did. For better or for worse, Victoria taught, Victoria taught us something about ourselves. I learned that time and distance can never dull the bond that we shared. I hope she can find peace. Rest easy, beautiful angel. You'll be with us always. July 17th, 1993. A beautiful young girl was born. I will never forget this day. My family was getting ready to head to the East Coast for a vacation with Bill, Barb, and Alana when we got a very exciting phone call at Aunt Jean's house that we were getting a new baby cousin, meaning that Victoria would soon be a gothic. I remember not long after Victoria's arrival how proud her big sister was of her. The love those two shared as children was so strong. Alana loved being the bossy big sister, and Victoria adored her. The two of them were like peas in a two peas in a pod, where they played well, they shared lots of time playing house, Barbies, and watching Disney. For those of you who don't know me, I am one of Victoria's cousins on the gothic side. The Gostick cousins had a tradition of summer camps at Aunt Jean's house for as long as I can remember. All cousins were dropped off and left for a week by our parents. It was times like these that I share my fondest memories of Victoria. Victoria was the baby of the family, and she was always wanting to do the things the bigger kids were doing. All summer camps at Aunt Jean's ended in a concert put on by the the children. Victoria always wanted to be a part of that. She loved to dress up and play in the costumes as long as we didn't give her too many lines to memorize. She was willing to be and do anything Alana and I made her, and my favorite was when she was a fantastic little piglet and the three little pigs. I also remember summer camp walks with her to the end of the road, finding frogs, skipping rocks, and catching her while she would want to jump off the dock for hours. She was always happy when she was outside and near water. One funny memory I have of us as cousins was when a bunch of my cousins taught Victoria at a very young age to say, poopy diapers. We taught her that that should be the response to any question she was asked. So after an afternoon of poopy diapers, poopy diapers, we sat down for dinner. One of the aunts asked Victoria, what do you want for dinner? Her response would be none other than poopy diapers. <laughs> Let's just say the kids found it a lot more funny than one of our aunts. <laughs> I remember Victoria as being adventurous and determined 
She skied by the age of two, and if you ever wanted to locate her on the hills, she was the one refusing to car, bolting straight down the hill at lightning speed. She was also a force to be reckoned with on the ice while she played hockey. She loved any sports that involved the water. Victoria had a mind of her own, though. If Victoria decided it was time for a haircut, it was time for a haircut. Whether that meant that she did it by herself in her room with a stolen pair of kitchen scissors or not. Between the haircuts and the outfits she would mix mash together, when she dressed herself, Victoria definitely had her own sense of style. Anyone who knew Victoria will remember her for her beautiful smile and caring soul. Her smile could light up a room just as much as her contagious laugh. As we got older, I remember watching movies to the point of not being able to contain ourselves with laughter. In more recent years, when Victoria and I would cross paths, her caring heart was always apparent. Her first question to me always was, how are the boys? Victoria loved kids. She loved animals. The other love that was clearer than ever was the love of her family. Family meant everything to Victoria, and Victoria meant everything to her family. Bill, Barb, Alana, and Taylor, we will always remember our beautiful, kind, and caring cousins. Well, I really do think for capturing the essence of Victoria and the reflection where she has gone. I think there's only one more to go, Diane. And there are a mother's memoirs delivered by my sister, Aunt Diane. Summer, 
pulling your trailer to the east coast, all the way to Newfoundland, to the west coast, right up to the top of Vancouver Island, family reunions in Alberta, Disneyland in Florida one March break, whitewater rafting in Ottawa, trips to Quebec City. One summer, we spent six weeks in Europe where we were lucky enough to have family to stay with and travel with. Victoria loved happy hour there. Happy hour to her was when we would all sit down before dinner and play games together. She also loved going to the Caribbean. Punta Cana was her favorite. It became a tradition that the girls and I would go, usually the last week in August, before school would start, to spend a week pampering ourselves, relaxing, snorkeling, sun tanning, and swimming in the ocean. Quite often, each of the girls would take a friend. March break was spent at Blue Mountain Inn skiing and snowboarding, where our hotel room would be filled with wall-to-wall -wall cots to accommodate their friends. Skiing was something we all enjoyed and did together as a family, and Victoria was the best skier of us all. She was the only one who had to have freestyle skis so she could do her tricks. Victoria and Alana's dad had decided after one winter of handskate that his girls would be hockey players, not figure skaters. They developed great friendships through their hockey teams in Dundalk and Markdale. I was usually the trainer, so I got to be on the bench with them. So their friends and parents became my friends. There were lots of long van rides full of hockey players and hockey bags packed to the roof. Hockey tournament weekends at Bay Area and Brampton and hockey parties. Easter weekend for many years was spent in Niagara Falls when Bill played on the Dundalk Old Timers. The girls loved that weekend swimming in the pool and spending money on the amusements on Lundy's Lane, usually each with a friend. Music camp in Southampton became a tradition and we would camp at McGregor Point Provincial Park each summer for a week. The girls would practice their songs around the campfire with a big concert the final weekend. We camped at many provincial parks, and Victoria recently told me how much she had loved our camping trips together as a family. Anyone who has spent time with Victoria knows she loves animals, and it was on a trip to Alberta when she was about 10 that she informed us on a daily basis that even though we had always had a dog, she really wanted to have her own pet dog. It didn't take long after we returned home that Nancy Thompson showed her the pictures of her latest litter of Shih Tzu puppies, and Victoria was at the kennel picking out Clover. Her first puppy of approximately eight that she was the proud mother of. She named the, the first thought or thing she saw. So we had a Clover, in the summer, and then the names became more sophisticated. Coco, Miko, Myla, Ollie, and most recently, Dakota and Zazu. She loved her dogs because they didn't judge her and they showed her unconditional love and affection. She didn't limit her menagerie of animals to dogs. There was a rabbit she had to have because Chantel had one. Many, many fish, and the pot-bellied pig. P, who lived up to its name well. <laughs> Many of these pets were surprises to all of us and had to be kept hidden from Dad for a few days. <laughs> he still doesn't believe that she ever had a rabbit living in her bedroom or a pig in our basement. <laughs> Victoria was 12 when our house and all its contents, including all the linens and possessions, baby and childhood memorabilia were destroyed in a fire. It was a PD day, and luckily both girls had stayed at a friend's house, and Bill and I were both at work. Although it was a very traumatic event for all of us, Victoria has told me her memories of us living in the cottage while our house was being built are filled with happiness. 
She said, the smallness of the cottage made us a closer family, and she fondly remembers doing dishes together in the old-fashioned way with a sink of water and a drying towel. She also remembered how happy she was going on all those shopping trips to replace her clothes, personal belongings, sports equipment, and helping me pick out things for the house. When Victoria was in school, she had a wide social group of friends that spent a lot of time at our place, and some have stuck by her through thick and thin. I want to thank them for being so supportive of her. Victoria valued her friendships and was happiest when she was hanging out with friends and planning a social outing together. She also enjoyed being part of a large extended family. She told me she told me she loved it when we could all get together with so many aunts, uncles, and cousins. And depending on where the evening meal was, whether at home, grandma's or the farm, there'd be so many people that we would have to set up an extra table where the cousins would sit. She said she never felt old enough to sit at the adult table, and she loved the camaraderie of the kids' table. Victoria loved food, and when hope grandma or one of her aunts were cooking the traditional foods she associated with their places. She became a wonderful cook and loved experimenting with new recipes and trying all different types of food. The spicier the better for Victoria. Victoria was so proud when she got her first job as a hostess at Fireball Pizza at Blue Mountain. She was outgoing, beautiful, and loved meeting people, and it gave her self-confidence a great boot. She loved earning her own money because she loved to shop. She had a wonderful, unique sense of style and filled her closet with beautiful clothes, bags, and shoes. The bigger the purse, the better. Victoria had always had a difficult time being away from her mom, so when she graduated from high school, and told me rather than going to college right away, she wanted to do a volunteer experience, preferably in a warm climate. I encouraged her to do that. After much research, she booked a two-week trip to Costa Rica, where she would live with a local family and volunteer her time in an orphanage. She was looking so forward to it, and then the night before she was ready to leave, she told me how scared she was. She thought she would probably get lost, kidnapped, or worst. She was too afraid to go and would have to cancel it. Me, being the practical person I am, told her, I paid for the plane ticket and you were going. I don't care how scared you are. <laughs> All the way to the airport, she's telling me, I don't think I can go. So at the kiss and fly, it wasn't a very happy occasion. And as she left crying, told me, probably will never see me again. <laughs> she did arrive safely, and she loved the family. She stayed with and the experience. She was so proud that she was able to do that on her own, and she felt she had helped those less fortunate children. She enjoyed it so much that she booked another one a few months later back in Costa Rica, and was able to stay with the same family. She was always planning on doing another longer volunteer experience, which I was encouraging her to do, but told her she would be paying for her own plane ticket this time. So unfortunately, it never happened. Victoria moved to Collingwood when she was 19 because she was in love and felt she was mature enough to start living on her own with her boyfriend. That relationship lasted a couple years, and Victoria continued to live in Collingwood for the last five years of her life. Most of the last three years by herself. I spent a lot of time with Victoria at her condo, and we had many enjoyable times together. Eating out, going to movies, walking dogs, 
and just spend time together in the condo, cooking and talking together. Although we didn't always agree, and there were lots of arguments and crying, we had a very close relationship. Victoria had no problem expressing her feelings, and she shared her innermost thoughts with me. Every disagreement ended with her telling how much she loved me and how blessed she felt that I was her mom. I, in turn, told her I was the lucky one to have chosen to be her mom. The last four weeks, when Victoria was so very ill at the hospital, was the most difficult time of my life. As time went on and she got weaker, I knew she would not be coming home with me. No parent should have to watch helplessly as her child's beautiful mind and body declines. There is some peace in knowing that Victoria isn't suffering anymore and that I was able to be with her to the very end to provide some comfort and hold her while she had to endure that decline. I will draw comfort in the days to come in remembering the many happy memories I had with her and feeling so blessed to be have given the privilege of being her mom. Thank you to my family and friends and Victoria's friends for all the kind words of love and support. It warms my heart to be reminded that although Victoria's life was too short, she had many happy days growing up and she was loved and will be missed by so many people.
Barb and Diane, it really has been a reflection so positive with regards to what Victoria was. I think there's one last that we should hear from, Bill. If you're ready, I'll ask you to continue. Two references have been made to me living with a pig. <laughs> Lan, you've got ten fingers. How many years ago did I live with a pig? <laughs> Two years ago, where's Buzz Aikett? Buzz, get your cell phone. What's the price of pork in 2016? <laughs> and you're kidding about this pig, right? No? No, I'm getting the smirk. That's a father joke. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I lived with a pig. <laughs> I always thought all these years it was Barb that lived with a pig, but I was wrong. <laughs> we, we, we both did. Lan was a surprise when she came along. And she was born uh, this week in 1991. And uh, it had been a summer when I was a co-owner of an apartment building on the main corner of Flesherton where the bakery is. And the Lemonson Pates are currently in, in uh, Mexico and their daughters are here today. But we've been working long hours all summer. And late in August, Barb said when I got home one night, sit down. And I thought, oh my goodness, I have never heard the tone before. She didn't find a milkman out here or something, did she? And, and I looked at her and she said, I'm pregnant. And it was like, oh boy, hallelujah. And then eight months later, along comes Alana. But the story really started before that. Uh, in, in trying to get pregnant, we had uh, joined in with the Owen Sound Children's Aid Society to get on an adoption list. And to do that, uh, we were with wonderful friends that many of you know, Rick and, and Colleen Neidenmuller, because they were, they were uh, trying to get on the, uh, the list as well. And uh, to do that, you had to take a course and Rick, half a dozen nights or ten nights or <laughs> whatever, good times. But we had great friends with us that, that Rick and I played hockey together forever. And uh, we took this course and passed. But we were told we likely would never adopt a child because uh, in Gray County they'd adopted uh, one child in the last four years or something. And uh, at any rate, we had the, uh, the Eidenmullers and the Gostricks were, were two of the people who took this course. So when Barb got pregnant, we had to inform the children's aid of pregnancy. We get removed from the list because they, they wouldn't, uh, I guess, do the footwork to have uh, Barb delivering and have somebody placing a child a month or two later. And I don't think we could go back on the list until Alana was one or 10 months, there, there's some rules in there. So we had left the list, but once that time period was up, we went back on the list. So uh, we now got, got Alana and we're on the list. So there's been a, a mention here by Janine of the way it happened, but it's kind of not the way it happened. So we're up camping at Bosley Island and this is the uh, right to summer that we did every year, and there would be about 40 of us. And uh, Brother Jamie and Beth and children had joined us that year, except Barb and I had got a phone call on about the last day of school that uh, a, an expectant mother, and she'd be about a grade 11 or 12 student, from somewhere had decided that she was gonna put a child up for adoption. And one of the criteria of the placement would be 
They wanted siblings. So there were only three files in Owen Sound of families seeking adoption who already had children. So uh, when they went through the files, the mother had selected us as one of those three. So they said we would uh, like to interview uh, all the three uh, prospective families on the Monday of a long July weekend. And we're thinking, well, we're both at them, but I think this is more important. No issues, we will go to, to uh, Owen Sound CAS from Midland. So about 10 in the morning, Barb and Alana and I come out of our tent, and I'm not dressed like I am right now, but yeah, I wanted to make a pretty good impression. I didn't want to wear sandals or shorts or a tank top, and Barb looked pretty spiffy, and, and Alana's wearing a dress, and Alana's about 26 months old. It's July, yeah, 93 we're in, so uh, people are looking at, we come out, we go down, brother Jamie, where are you guys going? Where are you guys going? And there was more than Jamie asking. So anyways, away we go to the mainland, off to children's aid, and we'll see you guys at supper time. So we come back at supper, and I doubt if there'd been any drinking that day, but Jamie was at a picnic table, and he damn well was gonna find out where we had been, why were we dressed up in these costumes? And uh, I said to Barb, you make your call on whether we tell. And there can be heartbreak in telling because uh, prior to Alana, many of you or all of you will remember that Barb and I had twins. And we got the twins when they were 18 months old and they lived with us for a couple of months you can nod, yep, a couple of months. And while we were jumping the hoops with children's aid to get home studies, etc., etc., mothers, after all this is said, mothers and fathers have the right to uh, withdraw the children from, from the process. And for us, they withdrew these children from the process after us having these at all the, all the uh, suppers you talk about with the achets and the gospics. We had done that with, with these 18-month-old twin girls. So the heartbreak is when we lost them. I'm telling you, that was sad times. So whether Barb and I would, would tell the group, we had to remember that that mother would have the right to withdraw for 21 days after Victoria was born. And Victoria was to be born at the end of July. So we were there when the mother was about eight months pregnant. And uh, we had a great interview with her. And the star of the show was Alana because she didn't know any of the toys at, uh, at ki uh, not Kids or Us, at Children's Aid. So she would just pull another toy out of the box about every five minutes. And she stayed in the middle and played. And uh, Barb had taken pictures of our house and one of the photos Barb had selected was Barb was standing on the dock shooting the picture back to the house. It had a little bit of sandy beach. It had Fisher Price washing machine, Fish, Fisher Price range. And the gal said, do you live on a lake? This gal is about 17 or 18. Barb and I are both pretty skilled interviewers. The interview was ours, and we started telling her what a gorgeous lake we lived on and how much fun Alana had had and all her cousins digging ponds and joining one pond to the other and making this really the house in paradise. And with that, we ended the interview with her. It might have been 45 minutes. And we got home to a voicemail. Interview two and three had been canceled. There was no need to talk to other people when she knew where her child, male or female, was going to live. They were going to live on a beautiful lake with a sandy beach and Fisher Price kitchens. So she had selected us, and it was party time. It was party time. 
Then we're on our way to Newfoundland. That too has been mentioned here. And uh, Jamie has, Jamie Beth had a forerunner, big Toyota truck. So we had the trailer on behind that. We had a magic wagon, I think it was. Uh, my dad and Wanda were with us. Um, uh, four Gostics, I guess three at our side. What does that add up to? Too many. Too many. So we're heading, we're getting together now at our place to get these trailers packed. And more or less, we're off that day. And it doesn't matter what time of the day we leave because the destination that, that day is a three or four hour trip to my sister Jean. So we were, we were, I want Ellen to hear this. <laughs> oh, I know, I know what you're doing. <laughs> so uh, we were off to Aunt Jean's and we were gonna definitely spend the first night, if not the second night. So the question would be on this trip, if something happened, how would they get a hold of us? So we were brainstorming the community and uh, we had a lot of people cheering for us who, uh, had no one our, our problems getting these children. And Terry Bernard, I think thanks to Robert Akett, uh, found out that a cell phone could help us. So if we got Terry Bernard's cell phone, and the cell phone is about the size of that speaker. <laughs> and I'm not lying, am I, Rob? Uh, it's, and as you're traveling, it went on charge, but at night you'd get it charged up, and I don't, like, Whatever. We get to Aunt Jean's, nobody can get a hold of us because I guess we hadn't plugged it in and charged it or we'd left when it was flat. But I think either the Lamb and Pater Dawson's knew that we were going to Aunt Jean's. So we got a message at Aunt Jean's that if you want to be present for the birth of the child, it will be on the 17th of July, 2 p.m. on Sound Hospital, C-section. So we're thinking, oh boy, have we got complications here because she's not due till the end of the month. And when we met her, she looked to me like she was due. But anyways, the question is, are we going, Glenn says to go fast. Anyways, okay, I'm going to talk like come from away. So. We abort the trip to Newfoundland. We come back. Nobody's going to go to Newfoundland. We come back on the 17th. Uh, Victoria's born, but there's 21 big days. So we've got a pretty big crew at our place 21 days later, whatever that is, and they have till 12 midnight. So we did have a 1201 party going on, and the question is, would we get the phone call before 1201? And we did not. So at 12.01, I got to tell you, she was ours and she'd be loving with us for 20, 21 days. And that is the story of how, how Victoria came to us. I had taken a half-time leave, leave, so I was teaching half-time, Barb was half-time, and on, uh, I had the mornings. So I would take the mornings with the two girls, and then in the afternoon I'd go in and I'd teach shop at uh, High Point School in Dundalk. Barb would teach the mornings at Gray Highlands. I would pass the girls off in the parking lot. And Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we did nursery school. And on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we did Kids of Us, which is another parent program. And I can tell you, Alana and, uh, and Victoria, you know, they just loved, they, they loved it. When I was putting these girls to bed, my midway hockey was 9.30. So it was perfect. I could tuck the girls and get my, uh, my goodnight kiss and I could leave them. But I always did the same thing every night. So every night there was a story, except sometimes I always changed one thing to see if Victoria was awake. So when those three little pigs were getting ready to go out, they slipped into their work boots and away they went. And Dad, the three little pigs don't wear work boots. And she never let me away with, with anything. <laughs> then after their story, I would sing them a lullaby. And as I left the room every night, she would tease me right back. Dad, yes, Victoria, you don't sing as well as mom. <laughs> Good night. Every night she said that, but every night, every night I teased her. The, uh, the skiing that they talk about in the hockey, her favorite saying was, me too, me too. 
And she played hockey a year younger than Alana because Alana was already playing. She skied a year younger because Alana was already uh, skiing, skiing, skating. She did lessons at Tromblon. She did lessons at Blue. Uh, Barb and I and Uncle Brian and Aunt Dorothy and all the cousins were teaching them. And oh boy, we had a lot of fun on, uh, on ski holidays and hockey tournaments. That was a good time. In the fall, we would take the two girls out trick-or-treating for Halloween. Two different mojos going on here. With Alana, it was how can we get to the next house quicker, but she only wanted to go to houses where we knew the people, so we had to go to Dawson's house, we had to go to Pate's house, we had to go to Grandma's house. Uh, all the houses of the people that we knew, those are the houses we, we had to go, and the quicker the better, and the more they'd fill the bag. Not Victoria. How much candy did we get at Grandma's? We're going to eat it. She would sit down. You're not budging her until she'd eaten it all. Then you go across the road to Bob Clark. We get more candy. She would sit down, and she's not going anywhere until you eat it all. And uh, she, she would get home, but the cover would be bare, and the ladder would be home. I'm not lying. Yeah, it's, it's the way it was. It's the way it was. Um, birthdays were always special, and there's two people that, that have really driven birthdays in uh, in Atlanta and, and Victoria's time, and that would be Grandma Aikett. She she celebrates every birthday that she recognizes it's a way to bring the family together and do a celebration. And the guy that drove it was Tom Anderson, where Tom would film it. But Tom was the most incredible orator that as he's filming these children, they were all a superstar. And he would have more fun going on in front of that camera and by the end of the taping, all of the children had been in there, and he had orated what they had done in the last year, and uh, Diane had given us uh, this week a bunch of those tapes, and trips down memory lane, oh my gosh, that was, yep, good times. The, the gift way we do gifts at uh, Gospics is you pick three gifts a year. You put them on a list, and Santa will decide. So anyways, the girls came to me for what three gifts I wanted. And of course I wanted four, but three is all you can put on the list. I wanted a new saw, I wanted a pair of work coveralls, and I wanted a pair of Crocs. <laughs> so the girls were wearing these new shoes, these Crocs you just slip in when you come home. And they're almost, they're almost too good to be true. So anyways, I wanted this pair of Crocs, so I didn't know which of those three that I would get. Comes Christmas morning, and Victoria's got my gift over. You're opening your, your gift first. I said, we've never done this. You girls open your gifts. Your mom and I will watch this. Nope, you've got to open your, your gift first. I said, well, I have forgotten what I asked for. You asked for Crocs. <laughs> and. Uh, so she knew exactly what I had asked for. I said, oh, okay, and she got the gift right there. And she said, yeah, no, you open it right now. You, well, I said, you girls don't want to do your, no, no, you open it. Well, I said, if they're Crocs, I hope there's not just one. No, no, there's two, there's two, there's, there's two. And uh, I'm opening, and she says, you remember the color? I said, yeah, exactly, I remember. I don't want Crocs that you, if you wear, I'll know they're mine. So. She says, mine are green, mums are blue, Alana's brown. I wonder what yours are. And we opened it up. And, <laughs> and Alana and Victoria killing themselves. You wanted something that we didn't have, so I got my pink Crocs from them. And I had them till last year. One floated away when I was rescuing a boat. <laughs> oh. Uh, Victoria the barber, yeah, believe that alone. Victoria and I both thought hair is overrated. But th the other story was a, a classic up at the Eidenmuellers. We did a lot of meals back and forth with, uh, with the Eidenmuellers. And Charlene, you'll remember this one too. So supper is over, and I don't know what women do in a kitchen after supper, but they order the men down to the TV where the Leafs are playing. <laughs> and they, they make the children go with the men. So how they can supervise the children down with us from upstairs, I don't know. But anyways, Rick and I are watching the leaves, and Victoria wants to go upstairs, but we're telling her she's not going upstairs. She crawls underneath a glass table, 
And all of a sudden, you would have thought a rifle went off. She had humped up and come down fast, and there is a girl in a thousand shards of glass. And I don't know, how old is she, right? Uh, yeah, 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 Colleen's agreeing, yeah, a three-year-old. And I'm like, oh my gosh, don't move. R Rick says, what do we do? <laughs> and thump, thump on the steps, there's two women came down. What is going on down here there? Victoria, don't move. Somehow we got all the glass sorted out. We didn't kill her. We, di we didn't kill her. We're going down to Charlottetown to watch the, uh, the play Anna Green Gables. And it was the first time that the girls would have seen it because we had to pick plays out that children would like. Barb and I have a great love of live theater. And we had taken them to Toronto to see Lion King. So that was the right play. Anna Green Gables would be a good play. So any of you that have read Lucy Maud Montgomery, she's got about 100 great stories. So all the way to the East Coast, and we've got about 1,200 miles of reading to do, uh, Barb is reading every day probably two stories. So it helps shorten the day. But all of the, all of the tales about Anne and Gilbert Blythe are in there. So we get to the theater, and we're going in, and Victoria recognizes that Charlie Farkas and uh, Don Heron only uses about six of the hundred stories in the Anna Green Gables play. So she'd be tapping me on the shoulder. When does Gilbert fly, climb out on the tree and fall in the river and, and knock Anne out of the boat? I, that one's not in here. So a while later, she's tapping my arm down. When does Gilbert do this? Because Gilbert, you know the story. So uh, they, they enjoyed Anna Green Gables. I think they enjoyed the, uh, the stories more, Mom. We got, we got more mileage out of that. Somebody's mentioned Barbie. We've got the floaty boat, the pontoon boat. What I remember about pontoons with the, uh, the Dawson girls, uh, the Lemon girls and the Pates, oh my gosh, the amount of Barbies inside there, the stock markets for Mattel must have been over the top. They literally would have a, they'd have a village set up with Barbies as we floated around the lake. Good times. When I was doing a reno, down at the ski toe, a guy's pointing to everything in his basement that he wants out of there. All the furniture ended up going to an apartment at Western University, but there was a weight machine, a big clanging weight machine, and he wanted that out of there too. So I, I was getting the thing out, and I asked Barb, you think we could bring that into our home, put it in the basement, would Victoria use it? And yeah, we have to take it apart to get it in, but we took it apart, we took it down. Barb laps on that she doesn't know how to use this weight machine, Victoria's taken a fitness course at Gray Island Secondary, so she would teach Barb how to use the machine. Well, as life would evolve, in the evenings, clack, clang, clack, clang, she would go down, and you could do weightlifting, you could do legs, you could do shoulder muscles, you could do it all on this machine. That's when she uh, took fitness seriously. And then from there, she went on to that tag fitness in uh, Collingwood, joined the, uh, the fitness club. And uh, I'll tell you, she was, she was a different person really after all that fitness and, and what a love for it. Uh, one of the things I remember about her friends, most of the sleepovers were at our house. Uh, Victoria had a hard time uh, uh, leaving Barb, but all these wonderful girls would, would come to our place and sleep over and you know, what great times and what, uh, what great memories. Um, I've got to say this week, I watched Alana and, uh, and Barb. They have organized uh, you know, all the pictures. Um, these guys that run funerals, they kind of plot against the families. What they do is they give you so much work, you don't have time to feel sorry for yourself. The slideshow, they took 14 hours to do, because they looked at 500 photos, and I list them to the comments while they do it total trip down memory, memory lane. And I gotta say, God bless you guys uh, for doing that. And when that's picked over, then the collages that you see out there, that, that starts eating up about a half a day. And it goes on and on. So these funeral guys, they keep you so busy that we end up with a day, God bless you. And uh, you know, I, I take a look and Taylor's, uh, Taylor's the friend. 
and what, one of your qualities, it's the same quality your, your mother has, you have great choice in men. <laughs> Taylor, you've been a rock guy. I don't think we'd have done this week without you. Taylor was at the hospital with us. Like, when I look at what he's done in support, you people out there have all said, what can we do? Well, get rid of Taylor, and I would have a job for all of you. <laughs> but with Taylor, like, he really put himself this week for us and, uh, and for Victoria. And uh, it's no wonder I love you, and it's no wonder I'm so glad of your choice, lad. Like, you cannot, you, you can't make better. Ten, ten. As for Barbara and Alana, Paul and all the, uh, oh my, I got a tear, I got a tear from him. <laughs> oh, no, it's his nose. Oh, as for Barbara and Alana, I got to say, you, you guys have done it, and, uh, and good for you. And uh, Victoria, I was only kidding when I said you're in charge of, uh, of today's weather. The weatherman today, if you watch uh, the Weather Channel, the person doing the weather today is Victoria's great friend. And that's the Bradbury girl from Preso. She's on the Weather Channel, so she's the one telling everybody to stay at home. And I, it, how, how fitting is it that Victoria's friend is, was saying stay at home? Anyways, I love you, girl, and, uh, and I always will. Brian, thank you so much. Thank you. Be before we run, the pictorial uh, tribute here, just a thing. Um, as you can see, when you're part of the Gostick family, you don't get one, you don't get two, you get the package of four. And what I will say, reflecting back to Victoria just for a minute, so to speak, so it was with all of you and Victoria and what it meant to all the family, to the uncles and aunts, the cousins, the extended family to the friends around that we've got here today, in fact. What a tremendous way to capture who Victoria was. And I think we were really successful today in doing that because Victoria meant so much to so many people in so, way, so many different ways. And when you just look back on the stories, there is a bit there for everybody, is what I would say, because of what she meant to you. So on behalf of Barb, Bill, Alana, and Taylor, all the uh, aunts and uncles, the Gostick family, the Aikett family, the cousins, and for those, I just want to say thank you for attending today with us. It's great to have you all here at this time. Great to reflect back upon Victoria's life. And with that, I think we'll run the pictorial tribute, if we might. And then I'll turn back to Pastor Adam. He's got a couple more.
Well, on behalf of the congregation, I want to thank the family for allowing us to share these moments with you and to come alongside of you today and tomorrow and the days ahead as well. You will need the community around you. So thank you for sharing the stories. Thank you for the tributes. Thank you for your presence with us. And we pray that uh, our uh, presence is also comforting. Please stay following the service. There's um, a luncheon prepared for us. Um, thankful for the ladies of St. John's United Church in Flesherton who have put on um, a meal for us to enjoy. So just from here, go right out and continue with stories and sharing together and memories and comforting and, um, and celebrating um, over the meal. And again, please drive safe as you leave us today. Um, please be safe um, as you make your way home. All I'd like to do, uh, I've just been asked to close in prayer. And what I'd like us to do is we need to know we're, we're in this together. And I'd just like you to grab the hand of the person beside you. Or if you need to, need to stretch back or something, if you're sitting alone, feel free to get up and move towards someone else. But uh, we need to know that we're in, in this together. And um, I'm so thankful for um, the gift of one another. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this time together. Lord, this time to share memories and stories of Victoria. Lord God, thank you for Victoria. Thank you for the preciousness of her life. Lord, her one-of-a-kind life, her love, her family, family's love for her. God, I want to thank you for the love of an adoptive family, unconditional love. Lord, the love of a mom and a dad to always be there, no matter what. A sister, friends. God, that kind of love is a picture of your love for us, that you love us unconditionally. And so we commend Victoria to you, O oh God. We commend her to you. We commend her to your mercies. Thank you, O oh God, for the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ that we have hope today. Father, that he came. He came for us. He lived for us. He died for us. He rose again. That we have hope for eternal life because of Jesus and his amazing love for us. Thank you for Jesus. And God, I thank you that you're going to be with us uh, in the days and months and years to come. That you never leave us nor forsake us and that you have created us to live life in community and not to be alone. And so, Lord, I pray that out of this service today that e each of us will perhaps hold the hand of a loved one tighter, take the time to make those calls, take the time, carve out time to be with each other, to remind one another that we're not alone. And I'm so grateful, oh God, for these memories today, and for this service that we could find in coming together and find in you um, a sense of comfort, a sense of peace and purpose, even in the midst of this great loss. So comfort the family going forward. I pray your blessing upon this luncheon now, the fellowship time, that it too will be part of the process of, of just uh, being together. And Lord, uh, for all that you um, have taught us, to the precious life of Victoria Gostick. May those lessons be continue to be taught and to heard in our lives. We thank you, Lord. And now I pray the very love of God, the Father. I pray the very hope of Jesus, the Son, and the very presence of the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. Amen.